Hi, and welcome to GM Tips. I'm your host, Satine Phoenix, co-creator of Maze Arcana and Dungeon Master of Savage Nation. In previous episodes, we discussed a few general ideas about being a GM and how to find players in the community. These next episodes are a more in-depth discussion about creating your adventure. Today, we talk about story structure. GM tip number one, storytelling basics. Building a story your friends will remember for ages takes more than just creating a beginning, middle, and end. There are a lot of resources available for you to learn how to build a story. Whether it's a novel, a screenplay, or RPG, you can utilize these basic guides for your adventure. Why is this important? Because each player at your table is the lead character. Follow these guidelines in weaving your story, and you'll be able to connect to your players naturally. Some of my favorite books on the subject are Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell, The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler, and Story by Robert McKee. McKee's book Story is the most in-depth book on actual story structure. He breaks down the different elements of the story from scene, beat, sequence, to acts, and talks in incredible detail on how to manipulate the different parts for specific effects. He discusses plot and subplot, timeline choices, scene design, where story meets character. It's way more dense than I'm able to list in a couple minutes. This book is the foundation to your story and my top suggestion of must-reads. Hero with a Thousand Faces and The Writer's Journey discuss the underlying pattern to all stories, linking them all back to mythology. In these, we learn about monomyth, the basic story pattern that our hero goes through based on what Carl Jung calls the hierarchy of needs. In the beginning, we meet the hero. Then he hears the call to adventure. He's reluctant at first, not wanting to stray from what he securely knows, but then a wise mentor of some kind guides or shows him his strength, moving him along his path directly into the first threshold. This is where your adventuring party usually begins their quest. They meet others along their journey, some allies, some enemies. They're tested, establishing their character. Then they dive deeper into the unknown until they face their supreme ordeal, moments away from death, from a battle or facing something that disables them emotionally. Our hero is at his darkest and may never recover. Suddenly, he's back on his feet, finds his strength and seizes his sword. He knows he must continue his journey and has learned from the moment. He gets back on the road, faces the big bad again, now stronger, and transformed into what he feels is an actual hero. Defeats the dragon, finds the treasure, rescues the princess, and brings the boons back to his home. That's the basic idea of the hero's journey. R.K. Cyrus and I discussed the female's version of this in our book, The Action Heroine's Journey. These different people have different primal needs. Return with the treasure or ensure a safe homestead for your family are just two of the many prizes that will satisfy the hero or heroine. The key is to not make the formula feel formulaic. An encounter can be as brutal emotionally as a physical fight with a dragon. A game doesn't have to be talk, fight, talk. It's scene, up emotion, scene, difficult on the players. Scene, break from hardship and emotion. Scene, much harder on the players. And so on until they finish their quest. In a public game, you take all the players on this roller coaster. In a private campaign where you know the players and characters, you can take each of them on this roller coaster at different times, allowing one or two their moment to shine while others are at rest. The level of intensity is up to you, game master. GM tip number two, ask why. Your players know why they're at the table. They want to play. But why are there characters in this world? Why do they care about a quest? Why was the quest given? Why is one of the most important parts of a story. It can all seem to make sense until you start asking why. If the answer is just because, you're gonna need to keep working. Your players need purpose and will feel less invested if the reason is just because. GM tip number three, story flexibility. You have your story and the characters and the plot points. In order to hit these major beats and not railroad your characters, the plot and its pieces must be able to move around the game. Sometimes, a number of NPCs have varying levels of a clue for the players, or a house's rooms aren't certain until they're entered. This allows you to put players in a specific room at the moment you want them to enter it. That mostly works for homebrews. Often I'll write these elements on index cards, moving them around as needed. Some get edited as the story is unfolded from character choices. Sometimes the map stays the same, but the room interiors move so the map is reusable. 
I could roll on about this, but instead, let's discuss this with singer-songwriter, nerdist, geek and sundry, and alpha writer, and all-around party bard, Amy Vorpal! <laughs> Hi, Amy Vorpal. How? Welcome to the show. Oh, <laughs> yes. Another singer-songwriter on our hands No, here. that's just for you. Oh, oh well. <laughs> So we talked about the hero's journey in the mm -hmm. beginning, and you're an actual writer, so I want to know what your shortcut is that you actually like use for writing or stuff that you can mm -hmm. put into D&D. &D. Like, what, yeah. what is it? All right, well, yeah, I always think in terms of episodic, I'm sure a lot of the Geek and Sundry people have seen Mothership. I write for that show. I wrote for the Matt Meyer show, but everything in my life is basically episodic television. So it actually helps when you're uh, running a GM game too, because it's very similar. You have yeah. to write in episodes. <laughs> so yes, I use the Harmon's Circle and, and my writing partner and I also use that because it's a very fast, quick, easy way to get into Hero's Journey and communicate that to each other. And it's an eight step process. And uh, the way you do it, you draw, you draw a circle and you make eight little sections of the pie, draw two crosses. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, shortened version is you need something, you go somewhere, you search for it, you find it, you take it, you return to your beginning, and you change something, or you find that things have changed and you deal with it. For me, when I think of an idea, it's normally one of those points on the puzzle. A lot of times it's number five, find. And what find actually is, is you get what you want, but it's not what you thought. So nice. normally that's what my idea is, is it, 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 that's where I go. I'm like, what is the most surprising thing I can throw at people? And if you start there, then you have your structure to like fill in the wings of the, of the other things. So if it's like, oh, I want them to, you know, get the crown, but it actually, they, they don't know this yet, but it might poison someone or kill someone they love every day. And then, you know, or something like, yeah. and, and you're like, well, they think they got what they want, but it's not what they wanted. Obviously the, the repercussions are endless, but you have to build that up. Why did they think they needed the crown in the first place? Why were they reluctant to get it? Had they heard stories that maybe it might be dangerous? Probably. And then you go you go around and like see how they're dealing with um, you know the crown that kills people once a day. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good thing because yeah. we talked about why as well. Yeah, and I find that a lot of times you have this great idea and you're like, yes, this is the one. Yeah, and then you start asking why and you find it's Swiss cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to keep going deeper and deeper. The more you ask why, the actual deeper you go, get into the lore, and that can be said for anything as simple as a trap that you just put there. You're like, I want to make this a little harder trap. Well, don't just do that. Ask why. Why is that trap there? Who was here before? Then you get into why this dungeon existed. I've never asked why a dungeon was there. That's amazing. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, you know, and some dwarven probably uh, cult carved it out, maybe, or th some druids built it from stone, whatever, you know? Like, it's yeah. a... It's a really fun question to ask. And, and like I said, from every sentence you write as a dungeon master, you can get deeper in by asking why. You know, the deity told one of the players that there was a, they, they needed to go to this place. Okay, great, great. They, that's how you're getting your characters in. No, not yet. Like, why did the deity want it? Why did, the, why did this particular character, why not all of her other minions who pray to her, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, and sorry, all my deities are women, so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> in the hero's journey, we talk mm -hmm. about one character. Usually in TV shows, there's one main character that you're following. Mm -hmm. How do you do this for a group of players and making them each feel like they're important and lead characters? I like to think of dungeon mastering like playing an orchestra. So every every time you're conducting and and every once in a while it's someone's time for a solo, you know, like you can't get away from it. The strings are probably going to go throughout, <laughs> percussion is always throughout, and then everything gets silent and you hear the one like piano trickle come oh, in, you know? Cool. So it's it's an orchestra. There's there's always going to be a balance of who the spotlights on and you should balance it out between the players, but but there's no need to you know sinkhole everybody. Like it's oh, everyone's important time to shine. Like that'll just be a lot of crosstalk and everyone will go crazy. But I I think if you think of it like an orchestra, it's the string section this time. It's the warriors. It's, now it's the warlock. Now it's your druid. So yeah, you can definitely give them each time to shine. That that on that same note, each one should have their own little journey that you've crafted out for yourself, as well as the group as a whole, as well as the world <laughs> itself. We have the little wheel that keeps turning throughout mm -hmm. the campaign, and then you have the overall campaign or season. Yeah. And so how do you keep them all moving uh, seamlessly? <laughs> well, seamlessly uh. stuff. But, <laughs> but one thing you 
one thing I always try to do is definitely keep it flexible. You can always set up the you need go search find pretty easily. And then you do have to keep the last leg of the circle a little bit open um, because anything can happen. You know, you should know whereabouts you want them. But again, anything could happen. People could die like they might have to deal with that and, and really be flexible with where the story takes you. Because again, you're not the only storyteller at the table. Yeah. So you can prepare the, the launching of the adventure, but yeah. really be there to hear them as yeah. they're moving through so that you can start the wheel over again. You, you do need your little hash marks to happen. That's fine. You can use this circle, the eight, the eight little parts of it, very or organized in terms of timeline, too. So if you have 12 months, like it breaks up very nicely into you know these four little sections. Yeah. Uh, halfway should look like they've got what they want, but they it's not what they wanted. Um, same thing with three months. You know, then you know that uh, if you're playing once a week, then six weeks means they they should have that they should feel pretty good about themselves until the next time when you reveal that. Ha ha! <laughs> it's not exactly what you thought. What does your pregame house rule look like? I usually play with my friends, so they all know me. But one thing I do always say is, uh, we're all here for a reason. We all like each other. Okay, so we're all gonna, you know, we're all in this together. And then before I get started, I, it probably I'm doing an exaggeration, probably, but I, it's me, so I probably, okay, this will be fun. <laughs> like, I mean, and that's a little bit of me psyching myself up, a hundred percent honest and sincere, and then also psyching, you know, them up as yeah. well. <laughs> that's awesome. Brings the energy. Yeah. What is your favorite GM moment? I'm going to take this opportunity to plug a little thing that we call D and D A A R P G. Uh, it's two episodes only so far, but it was I got the chance to GM for a bunch of old timers who were newcomers to Dungeons and Dragons. Penny is. Penny is. What does Penny look like, by the way? Raven-haired, blue-eyed, skin like milk. And when she takes that black wig off, it's going to be Amy. <laughs> uh -huh. it's me. Oh. I think Penny must be Amy because once in love with Amy, always in love with Amy. And that, I mean, I want to say the whole thing was my favorite. They were, they just jumped right in. But one of the most memorable moments was I just introduced a freaking NPC who, you know, one of the characters was in love with. And, and Art, the older gentleman, decided that it was Amy in disguise. And it was like... <laughs> Wow, I, this is a backstory that even I didn't think of. Like he, it was so funny. He was like, "It's you. It's you in a wig." And I was like, uh, "Yes, like absolutely, it is. <laughs> like if that's the way you see the character, then then very cool." And he made a once in love with Amy joke, and he was being super flirtatious about it. So I was like, "Yeah, we're going there." <laughs> yeah, that's really cute. Yeah. <laughs> What's your GM tip for the audience? I'm gonna steal some time and take three. The first one, make eye contact with your players. This is an, in yes, like that, <laughs> a very interactive game. That's one way to bring them in. Two, uh, use uh, GMing as an exercise in humility. Say thank you, this is not, it, you put a lot of work into it, but you're lucky that you have players to play your story. Number three is to have a prop. And if you haven't, a lot of people use very intricate table settings, but if you have, if you don't have anything, use something that nods to the location where they are. So it could be a little statue that you have, a little trinket, a piece of clothing that you hang on the wall, but one, one prop can change the entire table. That's it for today's show. Thank you, Amy, for playing with us today. Thank you. You can find her online at, at VorpalSword. Stay tuned for next week's GM Tips here on Geek and Sundry. In the meantime, you can find me every Sunday on twitch.tv slash Arcana. See you soon. Amy, <laughs> GM us out of here. Awesome. All right, in front of you are two devastatingly beautiful women. They're on a pedestal and they smile at you. On the pedestal itself, there are words and images and the words seem to describe the two women and the images explore more of their lure. And you know it would take days, days to dive into everything that you see there. So you don't, you're a little daunted. Uh, but you look more closely and you see that there actually are some tasks that are being asked of you. They're, they're menial tasks, but you can sense that they're gateway tasks to larger ones once you've done what they have asked. Simple things like, like, follow, subscribe. As you look down at your hands to do just that, you are surprised to find your hand has turned into a cursor. 
Then you wake up, it was just a dream, the vision's over and everything is as it was before you met these two devastatingly beautiful, amazing, talented, wonderful women. <laughs> you shut your laptop, you have the entire rest of your day ahead of you. What do you do? The adventure's yours.